I'm a okay. very happy one. <laughs> Right, I am going to make a, a start now, I think. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone um, to this session on the government's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, so I'm Cara uh, from Muscle Hill Sustainability Group. Um, I'm gonna do a quick um, intro, uh, then hand over to Paul, um, who's gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna open up for questions uh, um, uh, and answers and if we what we're going to do is we're going to mute everyone um, and we're going to do questions through the chat just to allow us to get through as many uh, questions uh, as we can. Um, so um, Muswell Sustainability Group probably most of you are aware of what we do but um, very quickly we're a local group of volunteers um, and our aim is to cut energy use and waste in the Muswell Hill area. Um, if you're not yet a member, we'd love you to join. Um, so this session is going to focus on the on the government's 10 point plan um, and it really follows on from uh, the government uh, stating 18 months ago or so now that they are going to reach net zero uh, by 2050 and this 10 point plan is uh, one of the cornerstones for um, achieving uh, that. Uh, question is whether it's going to be enough. Uh, obviously, the government would like to set a great example in the lead to um, uh, lead up to COP26, the, the UN uh, climate conference in November. Um, but is this plan uh, going to deliver it? So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Paul Eakins, who will be able to answer that question and many more. Um, and Professor um, Paul Eakins is a uh, director at the Institute of Sustainable Resources at UCL. Uh, he set up um, a master's called the uh, Economics uh, and Policy of Energy and the Environment, which I was very lucky to undertake uh, around five years ago now. Um, and uh, uh, Paul is a brilliant lecturer and I'm delighted to be able to listen to him again. Um, so um, I think with that, I am going to hand over to Paul. Well, thank you very much. Cara, and um, it's jolly nice to be with you again, albeit virtually this time. I've uh, been with you twice before and enjoyed it very much. And I shall miss the social event afterwards, the um, food and wine that we always had and the ability to share thoughts. But there we go, that's the situation we are now in. And um, uh, my wife's just had her jab, so I shall be on the list fairly soon. So. The light is at the end of the tunnel, and we very much hope that um, uh, we'll be able to get together again in due course. So uh, this is, as Kara said, this is the 10-point plan that was launched by the Prime Minister uh, in November with the promise of lots more documents to come, and you'll see a list of some of those at the end of my, my talk. Uh, and I don't want to be misunderstood because, um, firstly, I think it's a very good thing that he has launched this 10-point plan. Um, uh, and um, the net zero target was world leading in its day. A few other countries have followed suit now, uh, which is good. Uh, but it remains the case that the Climate Change Committee is a, a world beating kind of accountability institution. Those of you who've kept up to date with what's happened since the 10 point plan will know that the Climate Change Committee has proposed its sixth carbon budget for the period uh, 2032 to 2037, uh, and it is unbelievably ambitious. It's a 78% cut on carbon emissions from 1990s level on the way to net zero by 2050. Uh, the government still has to uh, approve that and put it in legislation under the Climate Change Act, which is uh, what it has to do, or it has to say why not, but it can't simply say, I, I don't feel like it, or it's too difficult. It has to give good scientific reasons why this recommendation is wide of the mark. So um, the, the uh, spirit in which my comment should be judged is that although um, 10 years ago, this 10 point plan would have been almost unthinkable in its ambition. Um, now uh, it's uh, barely enough uh, of what is required given the way the science has gone, given the way our whole experience of climate change has gone um, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you that uh, this is quite simply the single most important agenda 
facing humanity, bar none, certainly much more important than COVID. And if we started responding to climate change in anything like the way that we've responded to COVID, we would stand a chance of meeting the very tough targets uh, that we've set ourselves. So that's, uh, that's the context. So I'm now going to do what everybody does in this context, which is share my screen. And um, we practiced that, so hopefully nothing's going to go wrong. And I'm going to work through the 10 points um, uh, in half an hour, as, uh, as Cara said. Um, uh, if, if you have any, because there are, uh, the points are quite different, if you have any questions about a particular point, just put it in the chat before you forget it. And um, Cara and Mary then will monitor that and we'll pick it up at the end. So here we go. Right, so I think that's probably okay. Yep, people nodding. Um, so here we go. Uh, these are the 10 points. So you can um, see, get a, a very quick overview there of what they are. And uh, typical uh, Johnsonian uh, boosterism here, Britain will lead the world. Uh, it seems that Britain has to lead the world in everything in track and trace and, and the whole works. Uh, it will lead the world into a new industrial, green industrial revolution. It mobilizes 12 billion, which uh, you know, to you and me is, is a lot of money. Uh, but when you compare that with the 27 billion roads program over roughly the same period of time, because this 12 billion is not to be spent next year, um, you might wonder whether 12 billion compared to 27 billion is uh, enough. Uh, so let's go through these points. Um, offshore wind, um, well, we've got 10 gigawatts of this at the moment. Uh, Johnson has been very explicit that the target is 40 gigawatts by 2030. Um, the policy mechanism to achieve this is um, what's called contracts for difference, whereby you ask the, uh, the, the, the constructors or the developers to bid uh, for um, these contracts. And they then, um, it's an auction, and the government tends to award the contracts to the cheapest bid. And you can see we've had an absolutely dramatic decline in the cost of offshore wind. Uh, when it was started under the Labour government, uh, it was coming in at 150 pounds a megawatt, which is, um, uh, is, is that, and, and um, the most recent uh, bids came in at below 40 pounds a megawatt, which is about four pence per kilowatt hour, which is absolutely uh, the, the general wholesale price of electricity. So at that cost, and if you don't add on anything for uh, the fact that wind doesn't blow all the time and therefore you need backup, this is a very competitive price indeed. And it'll be fascinating to see what the next round comes in at, and that's due later this year. Um, uh, the 10 point plan says that the private sector needs to invest 20 billion in this uh, through this mechanism of contracts for difference. Um, a, an energy consultancy suggests that the costs are gonna be nearer 50 billion to get to 40 gigawatts, but we'll have to see. It depends obviously on how much the price comes down. The key issue for the UK is how much of this money will be spent in the UK. At the moment, uh, it's not 60%, as you can see, because 60% is the target. Um, uh, so that a lot of this money actually uh, is going to German and Danish companies uh, that uh, historically have been much better at building this stuff than we have because they got off the blocks much more quickly. Um, and then the key issue for the grid into which all this offshore wind has got to plug is what happens when the wind doesn't blow. And we've had a very good example of that over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I believe that uh, Storm Christoph is about to uh, get the turbines turning again. But over the last week or two, uh, it's, there's been very little wind. And that's meant that uh, the national grid has had to mobilize absolutely every uh, last uh, drop of power that it's got on the grid. And the, the, the marginal price, the, the actual price of the electricity coming onto the grid at peak times has actually been 1500 pounds per megawatt hour. So you can see uh, 1500 compared with 40 is rather a lot. So it's an expensive business when the wind doesn't blow. And that's a, a key issue for the next 10 or 15 years as we start moving towards 60 and 70% of 
uh, electricity coming from these sources. So number two is hydrogen. And the target there is five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen production capacity by 2030. I'm sure all of you know, but not everybody knows that hydrogen as an element doesn't exist naturally. So although it is in fact the most common element on earth, um, it has to be manufactured. And you either manufacture it from methane, uh, and then if it's going to be low carbon, you have to capture the carbon dioxide that comes out of that because you have to strip the carbon out of that methane molecule. Uh, or you can um, uh, manufacture it by electrolyzing water. But obviously to do that, you have to have electricity. Uh, electrolyzers are not currently cheap, though we hope their costs are gonna go down. So green hydrogen, which is what hydrogen from electro electrolysis is called, uh, is currently pretty expensive. The government is putting 240 million into a net zero hydrogen fund. It's going to uh, put in place a hydrogen neighborhood and uh, perhaps scale it up to a potential hydrogen town before the end of the decade. And, and this uh, illustrates a, real, a really big problem because I bet um, 90 or perhaps even 100% of, of you listening to this will heat your house with natural gas. And uh, I heat my flat with natural gas. And um, uh, I can't do that beyond about 2040. There has to be another way of heating my flat. And that's pretty difficult. Uh, the options are uh, basically three. The options are heat pumps or district heating or hydrogen. Uh, it would be possible to convert my gas boiler to burn hydrogen because, of course, hydrogen was the main constituent of town gas, which people who are as old as me will remember we used to pipe into our homes uh, back in the 60s, and then it was all converted to natural gas. Well, we would have to convert it back again. And that's the only way in which um, the very substantial gas grid, which we've built over the last 50 years, to uh, take all the natural gas. That's the only way that that won't become surplus to requirements. And obviously that's an investment of billions, which we would like to be able to repurpose for hydrogen. But there are all sorts of issues around that. So I've said uh, low carbon heating is one of the most difficult issues. The key issue there is the cost of this. It's many times the cost of natural gas. Then number three is nuclear power. You will know that um, nuclear power, uh, there is a new, new nuclear power station being built for the first time since the 1980s. It's at Hinkley Point C. Uh, it also had a contract for difference uh, at a price of 93.5 pounds per megawatt hour in 2012 pounds and it's uh, index linked. So it's now over 100 pounds per megawatt hour. And you can see that that is considerably more expensive than the last lot of offshore wind turbines that were commissioned. Um, there uh, is a hope. Uh, the industry has said it's going to reduce the cost uh, by 30%, which will still uh, make it more expensive than offshore wind, but it will obviously be cheaper than that cost there. Um, and the commitment in the 10 point plan is provided there is clear value for money for consumers and taxpayers. Not at all clear to me what this value for money would be. The main benefit, of course, of nuclear power is that it doesn't depend on the wind blowing, it's a constant source. It's not very flexible, uh, so you can't turn it up and down very easily, but uh, it is a good way of providing base load, provided uh, you can stop it from melting down and provided you know what to do with the waste. And those are obviously two big ifs. Um, there is also a provision to uh, start funding these things called mo small modular reactors and advanced modular reactors. Um, which in my view is largely a result of lobbying from Rolls-Royce, which wants to build these, uh, these things. We don't know um, whether they're going to work. And if they do work, we don't know whether communities are going to want them on their outskirts because um, the whole purpose of these relatively small power stations, and we're still talking about 400 megawatts. So this isn't a, a tiny little building. Um, and it may be that people are nervous about them and we'll have to see about that uh, if they work. Um, so there's a few million going to be invested there, as you can see, um, in this advanced nuclear fund. Lots of issues related to nuclear, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, I mentioned the cost, there's the feasibility and public acceptability of these advanced modular reactors and small modular reactors. Uh, there's the involvement of China, which is a junior partner in Hinkley Point C. 
It would be a junior partner in size, we'll see if the government commissions that, and it wants to build a new station at Bradwell all by itself. And um, you don't need me to tell you that there's a certain amount of nervousness in government about having China involved in that kind of infrastructure in the UK. Then we come to zero emissions vehicles. And um, this is uh, obviously something that um, is, is a big deal. Uh, from 2030, there will be a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars. Those of us who remember the uh, 10 year run into the zero carbon homes um, that was promised in 2006, and then George Osborne scrapped it in 2015, one year before it was due, wonder whether uh, the government might get cold feet at some point. But anyway, at the moment, there is due to be a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars in 2030. The sale of hybrid cars and vans, new ones will be allowed until 2035. There's one billion to support the electrification of UK vehicles um, and uh, an idea of developing battery gigafactories in the UK when uh, obviously if we're going to build electric vehicles, it would be helpful to build the batteries as well. Uh, there's a 1.3 billion fund to accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure. Not much point having an electric vehicle if you can't charge it. And there have been one of one or two horror stories in the newspapers um, of people with electric vehicles who've had problems. Um, uh, there's money to extend this to cars, vans, taxis, and uh, some money uh, to trial this for, for lorries. Um, uh, lorries are going to need a different technology to batteries. I don't think anyone is thinking that uh, batteries will be powerful enough to take a 30 ton lorry uh, along. And uh, it is thought that hydrogen might fit the bill there in a fuel cell, um, but uh, that remains to be seen. You may know that hydrogen is already being used in buses. There have been buses in London with uh, powered by hydrogen running around. Uh, Aberdeen has commissioned uh, 16 or so hydrogen buses. So these things are not science fiction. They do exist. They work. Uh, they, they're clean at the point of uh, the, the tailpipe emissions. There's a key issue. Will the UK have a car industry post Brexit? Um, I think that's a real question. And um, uh, I'm not a fan of Brexit, and I think we're beginning to see the problems with Brexit, and uh, the car industry has certainly got plenty of challenges. And then the second question is, can the UK catch up with China and the EU on batteries? China is, at w is currently way ahead on batteries, and of course it has a huge domestic market and is already selling half the world's electric vehicles um, and is going for batteries uh, like there's no tomorrow, and remembering what it did with solar panels where it uh, effectively uh, cleared up the market um, uh, and, and brought the cost down enormously, we can imagine they might be doing the same on batteries. This is a terribly busy slide, and I'm sorry about that. You won't have a chance to read all of that. Um, for me, this is the most exciting slide uh, of all. Um, uh, it comes actually out of a publication from the Department of Transport, and um, it is the first time the Department of Transport has given any sign of being anything except the Department for Roads. And um, uh, this most recent document from DFT is quite extraordinary in terms that, in, in, the, in the sense that it is certainly looking towards urban areas in the UK where most journeys are taken by public transport, cycling and walking. And I mean most journeys. Um, obviously there will always be some people and some purposes for which um, cars and vans are required. Uh, but um, as I cycle around London and have a look at the people in their cars, it's perfectly clear that most of them uh, could easily be either on public transport or cycling or walking. Um, and um, obviously COVID has made a big difference to this. No one wants to go on public transport at the moment, but hopefully uh, that issue will be resolved over the course of the next few months and the DFT can get back to um, uh, implementing this incredibly radical uh, prospectus that it put there and um, starting to take buses seriously in cities outside London. I can't imagine how people who live outside London get around at all without cars because the bus services um, are just terrible in the majority of places. Um, and uh, there's a, a fascinating one here that they're even going to restore the rail links removed in the beaching era. I was a teenager when um, beaching uh, did his job uh, of uh, 
decimating the UK rail system. So that was a really fascinating, a really fascinating thing to read. Thousand miles of safe and direct cycling and walking networks, not cheap, double cycling rates um, from 2013 levels and 2013 levels had already increased quite a bit. So the key issues here are to do with public transport ridership. Will people want to ride public transport again? And then this culture war from car users. I live in Wandsworth, not uh, Muswell Hill. And um, some of you may have picked up that um, uh, having installed uh, low traffic neighborhoods with money from uh, Transport for London, uh, Wandsworth has now ripped them out again because of the uh, pushback from car users, um, which I much regret, obviously. But um, nevertheless, uh, it's quite clear that uh, people still love their cars. They love their cars outside their homes and they love using their cars all the time, not uh, only for when they're doing things um, for which cars might be um, the, the only thing to use. And of course, that pollutes the air, that uh, congests the town, it makes the streets less safe, it means that children can't play in streets, all that stuff. The um, low transport, low traffic neighborhoods were supposed to uh, start. Uh, reclaiming the streets for those kind of more human purposes, but uh, um, it's going to be a struggle. Aviation and shipping are two of the most difficult sectors, um, and they're both international, so really it's got to be an international solution. They're both the international bodies, the um, International uh, Council on Aviation and Shipping uh, and the International Maritime Organization have been put, pull it um, have been dragging their feet enormously on actually addressing the climate change issue. They're both, both those sectors obviously are significant uh, emitters. And um, uh, anyway, you can see the stuff there, um, uh, rather small amounts of money to address uh, various issues. Not a lot is gonna happen here uh, without international action. The key issues are the cost of flying, um, uh, flying is very, very cheap. It's much cheaper than international rail, as I'm sure many of you will have found. Um, public attitudes to flying. Um, I don't know how, how widespread is this flight shame that started in Sweden, uh, the feeling that uh, people shouldn't fly given the climate crisis. Um, and, and then there's the whole issue of, um, you know, when you book a flight and you're asked to pay five pounds to offset your emissions, uh, precisely how effective that is. Um, uh, or whether it's just a, a sop um, and a way of uh, absolving oneself of feeling guilty. But um, anyway, that's uh, normally a good topic to have a good discussion about. Buildings I, I feel a bit nervous about because I know that there are many people in the, um, in the Muswell Hill Sustainability Group who know much more about buildings than I do. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm also very, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really skeptical about the government's willingness to tackle this problem, given that it's a very, very difficult problem, as anyone who's tried to make their home uh, a, a, an A or B label um, energy efficient building uh, will know. Um, so the future home standard is that there will be no gas boilers in new homes by 2023. Um, that probably would have, should have been from 2016 if the government hadn't uh, cancelled the zero carbon homes uh, plan um, at that time. Um, and that's, that's obviously much easier to do than uh, to change my central heating system in my flat from being a condensing gas boiler central heating system. Um, so that's going to happen from 2023. At some point, it will become illegal to, in, to fit a new condensing gas boiler. Um, I don't think the government has yet um, bitten that particular bullet, but it obviously has to be bitten uh, in order to get to zero uh, by 2050, because uh, gas boilers do emit a lot of carbon dioxide. Heat pumps are currently the favorite to replace gas boilers. And you can see there we've got this um, target of 680,000 heat pumps to be installed by 2028. Um, on current trends, that is hopelessly uh, unrealistic. Um, the UK is terrible at installing heat pumps. A uh, research project I'm doing at the moment did a, a case study comparison of heat pumps, heat pump installations between the UK and Finland. Finland really knows how to install heat pumps. I mean, Finland is not a warm country either. And um, they install shed loads of them. Every plumber knows everything about heat pumps. And they're really good at it. 
Um, the UK, our plumbers uh, don't know one end of a heat pump from the other by and large. And um, uh, when they do store them in, put them in, they don't work properly. Um, and then there are all sorts of other issues. I mean, I've been looking around my flat and wondering where on earth would I put a heat pump? And in fact, I would have to get ones with council permission to put a heat pump with my flat and I'm sure it wouldn't be granted under current circumstances. So there are all sorts of uh, really difficult issues around that. This 1 billion, which is now a 2 billion fund to extend the Green Homes Grant is a drop in the ocean. Um, it may uh, make more energy efficient some of the least energy efficient homes of people in fuel poverty. And obviously that is to be welcomed, but it's not gonna make, it's not even gonna scratch the surface of the 25 billion uh, 25 million homes that need uh, energy efficient work if uh, it's going to be feasible to to heat them all. Um, so um, here we've got a quote here, 2.8 million homes improving around 1.5 million to EPCC standard by 2030. Again, uh, on, the, on the basis of current evidence, that is absolute pie in the sky. Um, uh, we're doing, you know, a few tens of thousands of homes at the moment. Um, uh, and, and you don't get to 1.55 million. And improving them even to EPCC standard is more than just lofts and cavity walls. Um, you've got to do more to a building than that. And that of course makes it much more expensive. Key issues, their skills. And I was talking to this, uh, talking to uh, Mary and Cara about this just before uh, we all came on. Um, retrofit energy efficiency and, and heat pump skills are woefully inadequate. Uh, cost and who's going to pay. Um, uh, I, I did one house uh, quite recently, uh, three-story Victorian terrace, uh, got it up to about a B standard and it cost 30 grand, 30,000. That's one house. You multiply that by um, uh, 25 million. They won't all be as expensive as that, of course, but some will be more expensive than that. Uh, this is only a three-story Victorian terrace and, and you, you arrive at sums of money that are simply eye-watering. And at the moment, uh, the government isn't going to be able to pay for all of that. And at the moment, we have no idea how to incentivize homeowners to pay for it. Uh, even though over time, um, a lot of that money would come back, obviously, in lower bills. Mm -hmm. So the scale is wholly inadequate for 2050. So you can see I'm pretty skeptical on the buildings side. Then we come to uh, carbon capture, usage and storage. And the aim there is to uh, capture 10 million tons of carbon dioxide a year by 2030. Um, there's uh, 1 billion to, to do that, which sounds like a lot of money. But when you think that uh, 10 years ago, the government was, was saying it was going to have a 1 billion pound competition to build one um, foot one CCS plant, you can see that uh, in fact, either the costs have come down or uh, this is not going to be enough money to uh, uh, for, for industry to come up and um, Put up the rest. Um, so one billion would provide industry with the certainty that they would get one billion, but if they had to spend 750 million on each of those CCS plants, it's highly doubtful whether they'd be prepared to do that. So there's the issue again of cost. This is expensive stuff. As I say, the last plants that I was looking at, they cost about a billion pounds each. Um, what scale of public subsidy uh, is the government going to be prepared to put up? Is 250 million per CCS going to be enough? And uh, when it's done that four times, is it going to be prepared to do it another four times? Um, 10 million tons per year implies 200 million tons by 2050. Um, and 2019 emissions by themselves were 350 million tons. So this 10 million tons, although it sounds a lot, um, you wonder, actually uh, just, just how important it's gonna be. It could be important for that last 10 or 15% of UK emissions um, uh, in the 2040s, but uh, it, it absolutely doesn't um, substitute for us doing everything else. And I put usage with a question mark there because although um, everyone is talking about, it used to just be called CCS, carbon capture and storage. Then people started putting this usage in and, and you can use carbon dioxide for certain purposes. But all the, um, all the uses that I've ever seen really don't add up to a row of beans. I mean, if they, if they add up to a million tons, you're jolly lucky. And obviously a million tons is just a drop in the ocean. 
there's a very welcome recognition that nature is important. And that, of course, is the second big crisis that we're facing, along with the climate crisis. Um, and there's a whole lot of, uh, of stuff down here. The most important thing potentially is the environmental land management scheme, which is bullet point four, which is the scheme that will replace the common agricultural policy now that we're no longer in the EU. Um, the sums of money involved uh, are really very small, this uh, 40 million, uh, considering that uh, in order to make this a serious carbon reduction program, you have to plant um, huge numbers of trees. And in fact, there's no mention of of tree planting in this 10 point plan at all. Um, there's no mention of soil sequestration, which is where most of the um, carbon is needed, is going to have to go uh, if we want to get into negative carbon emissions. And uh, the whole purpose of calling it net zero is that you recognize there will be some emissions in 2050 and you need negative emissions through things like tree planting and soil sequestration to get rid of them. And um, so this is, it's a welcome inclusion in the 10 point plan, but what is there is wholly inadequate. And finally, we come to green finance and innovation. Um, this uh, obviously uh, is e everything I've said uh, requires money and um, uh, the sums of money that are listed there are neither here nor there, frankly, in terms of actually um, doing this, uh, um, making this, uh, this, uh, this thing happen. Um, but uh, again, it's important to do research. You can see there nuclear fusion, uh, again, raising its, uh, raising its head. Um, the ability of the nuclear industry to, to get money, uh, large sums of money, more or less indefinitely um, from the government is, uh, has to be admired. Uh, as a researcher, I admire that very greatly. Um, and um, a green jobs task force down the bottom, uh, recognition that uh, what I've said about green jobs uh, needs to be resolved and um, uh, whether the task force is up to the job uh, remains to be seen. So as I said, there was lots more coming and this is what's coming. Uh, we've had the energy right white paper. Um, we're gonna have a national infrastructure strategy. Um, and uh, I've put there, is Heathrow Airport gonna go ahead or not? Um, uh, it's clearly completely incompatible with uh, an, a net zero 2050 net net zero target, but um, uh, government policy is not always consistent in these matters. Uh, there's going to be an England tree strategy, which perhaps is why there wasn't any mention of trees in the 10 point plan. There's transport and industrial decarbonization plans or strategies. There's going to be a comprehensive net zero strategy building on the 10 point plan, which obviously I hope is going to ask, answer many of the questions that I've raised in this talk. A heat and building strategy, a hydrogen strategy, uh, the Treasury um, is uh, working on a net zero review, and it has to be welcomed that the first uh, that the interim report of the Treasury uh, on this uh, has for the first time acknowledged that actually there might be some benefits to a low carbon future, um, as expressed in this green industrial revolution idea. It's always been very skeptical about that in the past. And then uh, there's going to be a nature strategy, and uh, including one for trees, peat and pollinators. Um, the pollinators is interesting given that the government has just chosen to make um, uh, legal in this country a neonicotinoid, which is banned in the EU, and is, I think, the first example of the deregulation, which many of us suspect is the real motivation for Brexit, uh, the, 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 first, uh, the first example of that actually in practice. So that's uh, where we are. Thank you very much, and I very much look forward to um, your uh, comments and questions, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see all of you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, really informative. Um, uh, loads of content there, and we've got quite a few questions um, already. Um, so, Right, so if we start about, uh, we've got a couple of questions in relation to um, energy storage. Um, and, uh, and I think that's in relation to your comments about when the wind doesn't blow. Um, so could you talk about storage for backup and could excess wind be used for electrolysis as a way of storing energy? Um, yes, uh, 
uh, you, you know, those are really uh, informed questions. Uh, that's absolutely the key issue. Um, but if we could uh, get crack the storage issue, uh, then uh, there is plenty of wind and sun over the course of the year to uh, power uh, all these things that I've been talking about and more. Um, uh, it's very important to distinguish between different kinds of storage. So there's um, uh, short-term storage, um, the kind of storage that you need uh, in order to meet uh, peak and trough in terms of supplies, especially if you're going to uh, use a lot of electricity for heating. Obviously, um, those of you who've seen the, the, the maps of UK heat demand during the course of the day, um, it increases uh, at in the winter by, by a factor of five, and it increases over the course of the day by a factor of three. Um, so in over the course of the day, you can have short-term storage, and we can imagine that, that batteries might, um, might cope with that, especially if we've all got electric cars, and uh, cars can be charged up, the batteries can be charged up when we're not using them, and then perhaps they can be connected into the grid and give their charge back into the grid. And um, obviously, if it's one or two batteries, that's not gonna make a big difference. But if you've got 25 million batteries all doing that, and uh, so that's short-term storage. Medium-term storage, there's all sorts of possibilities, compressed air and all these sorts of things. Um, they, they all work, um, but they need to be rolled out at scale uh, and they're not cheap. So uh, when people say that renewables are not as cheap as the numbers that I showed you for offshore wind, because you have to have storage in order to um, uh, have provision for when the wind doesn't blow, that's quite right. And then we've got long-term storage, storage over a, over a few weeks, um, which we may need if the wind doesn't blow for that long. And sometimes in winter, when we're all wanting to keep warm and there isn't any wind, uh, that's, that, is, that can be a real problem. And um, at the moment, we've no real answer to that. Um, uh, electrolysis is certainly a potential answer. And um, when we've got not just 40 gigawatts of offshore wind, but 100 or 200 gigawatts of offshore wind in the North Sea, then we will be able to make hydrogen at scale. And there are plans to build a whole uh, artificial island out on the Dogger Bank, uh, where you would actually have a hydrogen plant out there, um, which would be capturing all the wind in the offshore sea, in the, in the North Sea. Uh, making hydrogen when it wasn't being used and you know overnight for example we're all asleep wind is blowing very hard um, uh, that that electricity at the moment is is not used so um, yeah definitely an option but definitely not one that is either cheap or available now but then we're a, a creative bunch and we've got another 30 years to, to get it sorted thank you um, so another question relating to offshore wind. Uh, so offshore wind might uh, get the UK to the carbon neutral, but it can't work for work most of the world. So should those uh, like the UK that have offshore wind play their fair share by getting to significantly negative carbon? Well, um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for getting to, I'm all for getting as much electricity as possible. Um, uh, but um, it's not entirely clear how wind gets negative carbon emissions. I mean, I suppose it, you could put up enormous uh, air cap, um, carbon capture machines. There are machines that actually suck the carbon out of the air. They're very expensive at the moment, um, but you could do that. But an advantage of some other countries that don't have offshore wind is that many of them have much more sun than we have. And... Um, uh, the price of uh, solar panels. I haven't talked much about solar panels, but solar panels are more or less cost effective without subsidy, even in the UK at the moment. And you may have seen these great fields of solar panels in some places. And, and some of those are now being built without any kind of subsidy at all. Um, and obviously, countries like Spain and south of Spain, um, in Africa, all the whole tropical belt, uh, the sun that they have could produce much more um, electricity than, uh, than they're currently using. Whether they would produce as much as they might want to use is a different matter. And it's highly likely that they won't go in for building these great transmission systems with, with these huge pylons because they haven't got them at the moment. 
in many of these um, uh, so-called developing countries, uh, they'll just jump it just as their mobile telephony didn't ever get go into landlines. They, they will build solar panels uh, at a community scale uh, with batteries that will, will give them 24 hour power. Um, uh, and we can see many examples of that. And Akari, you'll know a lot of examples of that from you know, your own Ashton Awards work um, where um, this is, is happening on a commercial basis uh, at scale in many tropical countries. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to take Chair's prerogative and ask a question of my own, which is um, the 10 point plan doesn't cover much about um, sort of consumption emissions, uh, all the stuff we consume. And I'll see a lot of that is made in, in, in China and other countries. Uh, so what about those uh, those emissions? What should the government be doing? Is there any policy that's going to look at that at all? Well, the only uh, the only actual policy, I mean, apart from making people like us aware of the fact that um, if we buy new sofas, new kitchens, uh, new clothes, whatever it may be, uh, they may not come from the UK, but their manufacture has environmental impacts and very often has carbon emissions involved in it. Um, apart from it, so you make people aware of that and obviously the whole kind of discourse around a circular economy and making better use of materials and not throwing so much away and all those sorts of things are very important in respect of, of that. But um, it's quite clear that there's no point us telling China what to do uh, about its carbon emissions. I mean, you can imagine Dominic Raab uh, lecturing China and saying, um, uh, now, now President uh, Xi Jinping, will you please not build any more coal-fired power stations? Well, I mean, like, uh, yeah. So what we can actually do about that is limited. The only policy which I think has potential is the border carbon adjustments, that everything we import from countries that don't have proper climate policy uh, do face a tariff at the frontier. And I'm talking about carbon and energy intensive industries here. So I'm talking about steel, chemicals, cement, plastics, pulp and paper, uh, other, other metals. Um, we, we, we know roughly what the carbon emissions of manufacturing those things uh, are, and we would simply levy a tariff at the border along with all the other tariffs that are levied. Um, and that would have a very powerful effect of causing other countries to think, well, if, that's, if I'm going to have to pay a border tariff which goes to the European Union or to the UK government, I might just as well impose a carbon tax myself and keep the revenues and then obviously I won't have to pay a tariff. And there are the more skeptical among us who think that um, China's recent commitment to net zero in 2060, which took us all absolutely by surprise, no one was expecting that. And on the face of it, it's very positive, but it might just have also been intended to position China on the right side of a border carbon adjustment, which is likely to be adopted by the European Union as part of uh, its European Green Deal programme. Thank you. A very different question now um, from Lynn um, and really about that sort of social acceptability. We talked about the low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, will disabled groups be considered with regards to public transport needs, or transport needs generally, I guess? Well, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'm, I haven't got a crystal ball, um, but a, I would very much hope so, uh, but B, I would also believe so, because I mean, I think one, one of the reasonable uh, developments that we've had in this country uh, over the last 10 or 15 years is much greater awareness of the needs of disabled and, and other um, uh, groups. Uh, I mean, the whole diversity inclusion uh, debate, I think, has been highly positive, certainly in my institution. It's got a much higher profile now than it had 10 years ago. And, and obviously I very much welcome that. So I, I, think, I think actually disabled people would be able to get about much more easily because those of them who needed to use the roads, the roads would be a much nicer place to use. Um, uh, and uh, obviously if the, the um, expectation is that, that most people use public transport, then well already, uh, public transport is becoming easier for disabled people than it was. Um, obviously, when you look at the tube map and you can see that by no means all 
stations uh, are, are, have disabled access. You can see there's quite a long way still to go. But um, nevertheless, I, I would hope that that were the case. Thank you. Um, right, I'm going to go um, to Bernard's question here. Um, so a uh, quote from Chris Goodall says, without an overwhelming commitment to greater social justice, a democratic society is unlikely to obtain consent for the painful, expensive and complex changes necessary to move us from a society entirely reliant on fossil fuels to one entirely free of them in just 30 years. Do you agree? Oh, that's a big one. Um, and do I agree? Um, let's, let's put it this way. Um, injustice has been with us for a long time. Uh, and we as a country have had a chance over the last 20 or 30 years to vote in governments to do something about the rise in inequality that we've all experienced. And we haven't done it. We haven't done it. We have consistently voted in governments which we knew would not tackle inequality. And the 2019 election was a very good example of that. If you make tackling injustice an absolute condition of sorting out the climate problem, my fear is that we won't sort out the climate problem either. And uh, the one thing I do know about justice is that the worst injustice we can inflict on the most disadvantaged people in this and future generations is not to sort out the climate problem. The climate problem is a matter of injustice of absolutely cosmic proportions. So um, while I'm absolutely in favor of the just transition, which is the way this uh, issue is normally expressed, and uh, fully welcome the fact that um, uh, the committee, the Climate Change Committee, for example, in its sixth transition, it's absolutely clear that we must have a just transition uh, I just noticed in the UK, um, unfortunately, that we don't seem to care much about inequality because we have an opportunity to do something about it every election and by and large, we don't do it. Um, and the, uh, so my worry is that if those two agendas become too closely entwined, the climate agenda will start to be dismissed as it has been in the United States as a left-wing conspiracy and we won't do that either and that would be uh, a real injustice for everyone who is currently suffering the, the uh, effects of climate change and you don't need me to tell you that there are already hundreds of millions of people around the world who are suffering from climate change not us by and large although storm Kristoff looks as if it's going to cause a few floods roundabout, but that's nothing compared with what uh, developing countries are having to put up with uh, on a pretty regular basis. So you can see that I'm, I'm there's a political pragmatist in me that uh, really wants to grip the climate issue and just do it. Uh, but I'm also very committed to the justice agenda. If we could do both, that would be wonderful. But perhaps the last thing I'll say on that side and, and, and I noticed this when I was working a lot on environmental taxation. And many of you will know that I probably talked to you about environmental taxation, actually. G is very regressive. It um, affects poor people uh, more, uh, proportionately more than it affects rich people, even though rich people use more energy. Um, and so whenever energy taxation or carbon taxation is proposed, uh, there's always an uproar that it's unjust. And I've always been very struck by the number of people who normally don't care tuppence about justice, who come out of the woodwork on those kinds of issues, and they suddenly start caring about justice. And I'm wondering whether actually what it is they're caring about is their own energy bills, but they find it quite useful to hang that argument on a justice banner. Because if we wanted to sort out the inequality issues in this country, it would be much easier than sorting out climate change. Thank you, uh, Paul, on that one. Um, a question on food waste and meat. So food waste and meat uh, rich diets are in the top five causes of carbon emissions. Is it not surprising that there is no criteria set to tackle either of these? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the answer is yes, it is surprising. Um, you don't need me to tell you that agriculture is a pretty hot political topic just at the moment. And diet and, and food is a very, very hot political topic. And of all the topics that um, the conservatives tend to get hit over the head with by the right wing press about nanny statism, um, food and telling people what to eat and how much to eat and what kinds of things to eat um, uh, are among the biggest. So I'm not entirely surprised that that's off the agenda. Um, I mean, interestingly, I think the whole food issue is fascinating because without really any government policy at all, the move towards lower meat diets or even outright vegetarianism and veganism is quite marked both in the UK and other countries. And um, certainly some of the really big businesses of the future are businesses that produce meat substitutes. And we've already seen, you know, the Impossible Burger and all these other kinds of things. Um, and uh, I eat quite a lot of those um, now. And um, uh, yeah, they're very, uh, uh, very palatable. So I can imagine that um, we, our diets are likely to go in that direction slowly. Um, there's a huge controversy about whether we all need to become vegetarians or not. And of course, there's all the organic food people who say pasture fed um, livestock is uh, actually good for the land and it's good for nature and all that. Um, difficult for me as, as an out and out urbanist really to, to know what's what in that particular discussion. But I certainly know that we need to, we generally on average terms need to eat less meat and that, that would be, that, that would do something for the climate. Thanks. Um, just uh, going back to your presentation and they, what really comes through very strongly is carbon capture and storage and the importance of that to the government's strategy. And you, you've talked about the fact that, you know, kind of very low investment compared to what it's actually going to cost. Um, but um, Brian asked, what is the current hope for the process of, um, of uh, CO2 storage? Uh, it's still under the sea. Is that where it's going to go? And we sort of know that, um, you know, I mean, carbon capture and storage has been talked about for the last 15 years, however long, a long, long time. And there's kind of over promised and under delivered uh, 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 over that time. So what, what do you think the current state is? Are we going to get there in time? Impossible to say, uh, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be the really uh, the real will globally. I mean, the UK is very well placed for carbon capture and storage because the, the gas uh, voids uh, under the North Sea are an ideal place for uh, carbon. We know how to do it. The Norwegians have been pumping a million tons a year under the North Sea for at least 10 years, but one million is one million. And um, it's not really uh, a serious uh, option, it's not really a serious carbon mitigation strategy unless you're talking about hundreds of millions of tons. Um, some, I mean, if you look at the IPCC models for what, what happens, um, uh, you know, how, how, how do we actually get to net zero globally? Most of these models are um, storing or removing carbon from the atmosphere to the tune of 10 billion tons a year. Uh, that's the scale of the challenge globally. Obviously, the UK is fairly well placed because we've got all this, um, all these caverns. Um, and, and therefore, in a way, it would be good if we could scale it up. Um, it's a technology that works. We know how to do it. The oil business has been pumping CO2 down into its wells for many, many years. Uh, it does it uh, principally at the moment in order to pump out more oil, which means that it's not a it's not a very effective carbon capture mechanism because it's using pumping down carbon dioxide in order to get up more carbon to burn it and put it in the atmosphere. So um, uh, we kind of know how to do it, but no one at the moment is prepared to pay for it. And the government, the Labour government in the early part of this century said it was going to have a competition. It twice said it was going to have a competition. Oil companies bid for it. There was a plan up at Peterhead. There was a plan in the Northeast. And just before the competition was due to take place, the government backed down and said, well, actually, we're not going to have a competition after all. Um, some of the oil companies have spent um, 
half a billion pounds on preparing for that competition. So they, they took it seriously. They take it much less seriously now with that kind of experience. So um, yeah, there's no way we can get to net zero without it. But at the moment, I don't see the necessary political will to pay for it. Okay, right. I think we'll just have um, one more question. Um, okay, hmm, carbon trading, which I know that uh, Paul can make lots of comments about carbon trading, I'm sure. Um, I believe that carbon trading is a key for a decarbonized society. The industry cap supports the development of new technologies and the necessity of carbon credits supports reforestation along the recovery of other natural ecosystems. Am I exaggerating or overseeing something from Andre? Yeah, um, well, um, I thought you were gonna ask me the carbon trading question about the EU carbon trading scheme, which uh, someone, uh, Tim Root, I think has put in there, but uh, I'll try to pick that one up as well. Um, I'm a carbon tax fan. And to me, the biggest tragedy in the European Union was that when the European Commission tried to introduce a carbon energy tax in the early 90s, the UK effectively vetoed it. Um, and we were able to veto it because it's a uh, tax at the European level required unanimity. So the European Commission developed its trading scheme instead, uh, which came on stream in 2005. And it's, it's been in its own way a great success. It has reduced carbon emissions the price of carbon credits has gone up and down like a yo-yo um, and it's hardly ever reached the the level of 30 euros a ton of carbon that was uh, was envisaged but uh, it is at 30 euros a ton of carbon now and the commission thinks that it's kind of sorted out that market and i think it's a very useful policy instrument um, for reducing industrial carbon emissions some of you will know that we've left the EU emission trading scheme, having left uh, the EU. We're going to set up our own EU, our own trading scheme, which of course is a nonsense because it'll be a tiny little market compared to the EU one. And um, of course, uh, the current thinking is that we're not going to join the EU emissions trading scheme because it's European, isn't it? Um, which of course is ridiculous from an economic point of view. But there we go. That's where the politics seems to be sitting at the moment. Um, and um, obviously the negative carbon stuff, which was the second part of the questioner's thing, is going to be really important because if we're going to plant zillions of trees, someone is going to have to plant the trees. They're going to have to have an incentive to plant the trees. They're going to have to have an incentive to look after the trees. And at the moment, the only incentive that they could be given is the carbon that is being captured by the trees. And I think we'll see that as part of the, of the environmental land management scheme that is taking over from the common agricultural policy, but we'll have to wait and see how that works out. Carbon sequestration in soil is the other big white hope. Unfortunately, really difficult to calculate, really difficult to know how much carbon you're putting in the soil and whether it's going to escape again, because obviously every time you plow a field, carbon is released from the soil. Um, and so if we're going to be serious about uh, burying millions of tons of carbon in the soil, and, and therefore it's not worth doing otherwise, um, then there's a lot of research going to be needed actually to make those numbers uh, solid and robust so that when people claim money for sequestering carbon in the soil, um, and the money is paid by the taxpayer or by someone, um, uh, we know that that carbon is there and it's going to stay there. And at the moment, we're a very long way from actually being being able to guarantee that. OK, right. We are pretty much out of time. So I'd like to say huge thanks uh, to Paul for both his presentation and for uh, answering all those questions uh, so well uh, and at, at length. Thank you. Um, I just finally want to say that we are going to be coming up with our own 10 point plan, hopefully for Muswell Hill Sustainability Group in our two strategy sessions that we've got coming up on the 1st and 10th of February. Uh, Mary will be emailing you about those and please do come along and bring your ideas for how we're going to transform uh, Muswell Hill to a uh, low carbon community. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Mary, did you want to say anything? Yes, I want to say it's 7.30 to 8.30 on those dates. So put in your diary now, uh, Monday the 1st of February and, sorry, <clears throat> the other one, <laughs> Wednesday the 10th of February. So it's 7.30 to 8.30, that's a two-parter. So your attendance is required on both, please. And we'll send out a questionnaire up front to kind of um, gather some views that will feed into those sessions. Thank you ever so much. And thank you, Paul, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> Mm. Bye, thanks. Night, 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 everybody. Night, night. Thank you very much, Bye. Paul. Thanks, Bye. thanks, Cara. Thanks, Mary. Hello. <laughs> I've got a couple of people. Save the chat. Hmm. And then there were two. Yeah. Hmm. Well done, Cara. Yeah. Very good. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Paul's Paul's just so knowledgeable. Uh, he's amazing, isn't he? I mean, I, I was really what I actually thought. Oh gosh, we've bitten off more than we can chew here, you know, in an, in an hour, I mean. But yeah, yeah, he just kind of smoothly deals with stuff, doesn't he? Mm. And gets the overview. So, mm. well, I've learned more in the last hour than I have in a long time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think it's good just to step back and get that big picture as well. I mean, obviously we're focused on the local stuff. Um, I'm just going to yeah. stop. I think that's the thing. I, I'm, I get very my.